Good Tuesday morning, guys. My name is Jerry Miller, and thank you kindly for joining us on the Jerry and Jerry Show. We are live in downtown Charlottesville, less than two miles from Scott Stadium. Live in downtown Charlottesville, less than two miles where we watched a Virginia football team suffer at the hands of the North Carolina Tar Heels in the South's oldest football rivalry. Ten quarterback sacks allowed, an offensive line that was Swiss cheese-esque, and now Virginia football heads into its bye week, not only searching for its identity, but searching for a, a, a sense of purpose to close the 2024 season. Many in the fan base are wondering if this football team will end the year on a seven-game losing streak, three teams on the docket remaining in the national rankings, and of course, the last game of the season against the Virginia Tech Hokies in Blacksburg. I would say sit back, relax, grab your coffee, grab your tea. I mean, heck, if you're like me and you're, you bleed orange and blue, you might be grabbing your, wood, your, your Woodford Reserve um, at 10.30 at 10 30 in the morning. Good night, guys. <laughs> Judah Wickhauer is behind the camera. He's the Elmer's glue of the network, and he's got Matt Schaub on the line over there. Hootie Ratcliffe set up this interview. My friend, I'm going to follow your lead here with one of the greatest quarterbacks in ACC history on the program today as well, and Matt Schaub. Hootie Ratcliffe, where do you want to begin? I, it's a pleasure having Matt on the show. Uh, I covered him when he played here. Uh, and for those who aren't familiar or are newbies uh, and don't know the accomplishments of this man, he was ACC Offensive Player of the Year and uh, Player of the Year in 2002, beating out Phillip Rivers. Uh, most NFL fans are familiar with him for sure, as they are Matt. Uh, his number seven jersey number is retired. He was MVP of the 2003 Continental Tire Bowl. He, when he finished his career at Virginia, he held 22 school records, which is unbelievable, mind-boggling. Uh, was one of the most accurate passers in the ACC history. 67% of his pass completions went on to an incredible career in the NFL, 17 years mostly with the Houston Texans. Two Pro Bowls led the NFL in passing in 2009. And uh, w one thing I wanted to ask him about, I was, I had forgotten about this. I, I know, I, I think I watched this game. Uh, in 2012, against the Jaguars, he threw for 527 yards, which tied Warren Moon for the second most passing yards in a game in NFL history. I, we'll, at some point, we'll talk to him about that and just ask him what that must have felt like. That, to me, is just boggles my mind. But anyway, um, Matt's live with us from uh, his home in Atlanta. He was up here this weekend. Matt, welcome to the show. Hey, guys. Thanks for having me on. Good to, good to be with you. Thanks for taking the time. It's absolutely our pleasure to have you. Hootie Ratcliffe rattles off your credentials. I say this, you're just a big time baller, man. Uh, you are calling the, uh, calling the game on, uh, on Saturday um, next to Johnny Freeman, next to Mod Hawkins, friends of the program. I'll get out of your way, Matt Schaub. Tell us what you saw from, from the booth. Yeah, you know, I think the expectation going into the day was a lot different than how it transpired. I mean, I think we all feel that um, just looking at both football teams. I thought we were, had a very even matchup, to be honest with you. When you look at the talent on both sides of the football, I thought it was going to be a really hard-fought football game. And I loved how we started. Offense went right down the field, got to the one-yard line, and it felt like you, know, you referenced it earlier. Um, when that snap went over Anthony Calandria's head on first and goal on the one, it just snowballed from there. And there was no stopping the bleeding for the Cavaliers from that point forward. Had they scored there, how would the game have gone? How would momentum have played? Uh, but it, it can't go understated. I mean, you had an offensive line that had to really be shifted around last minute when you have your center, who is the anchor of that group, not be available to play. And you have to move someone over. And your backup center is hurt and out for the game. And you have someone that really has never taken any snaps, didn't get to practice all week at that position. Like that is a not easy and that's a challenge. So as elementary as the quarterback center exchange can be, 
it, 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 that's a tough situation for Noah Josie to be in. I know he's a veteran player, but that's not easy, as well as all the guys up there. But to go back to the game in total, um, I, I just feel like the defense somewhat um, didn't play nearly to their standard. Um, just a lot of the missed tackles. I think this week, given the bye week, is a, is a turning point for this football team. And look, them, look themselves in the mirror and look at each other in the meeting rooms and going out to practice and really get back to I know Tony Elliott said it last week coming off the Clemson game, that you're going to go home and, and practice and recommit to the process and the details. Well, this week, you got to get even more detailed. And really find out, okay, where do we want to go? We're 4-4 four and four as a football team. We have four games against really good football teams coming up. And the mis- all the missed tackles that they had, all just the mental mistakes, and just things that they could control, right? It's one thing if you lose a football game to a team and they just play better than you. It's another thing when you go out and you don't play well because of things that you can control. They ask something that the coaching staff and really the veterans on the team really have to point out, and they really need to decide what this team wants to be when it's all said and done um, in you know end of November. You're right on about that, and you know some people asked why they didn't go with the Grady bunch, the tush push down there, and it goes back to the same answer that you just gave about uh, Noah Josie hadn't practiced yeah. that, and uh, that that wouldn't be fair and probably not effective if if uh, he was unfamiliar with that phase of the game. But you're right about the the quarterback center exchange. I was in. Uh, it's a story going back to the George Welsh days. I watched him practice one day, which media normally doesn't get to do but I was over at Scott Stadium for a Saturday morning practice and they kept screwing up the quarter of uh, the center quarterback <laughs> exchange over and over and over again and George stopped practice with a few expletives uh, until he, uh, he said if we do this one more time <laughs> this practice is over and, and sure enough two snaps later uh, there was a fumble on that, that exchange, and George was so upset that he threw – not only did he throw the entire team out of practice, but he threw the coaching staff out of practice too. So <laughs> that shows you how <laughs> how that can really uh, upset the apple cart, so to speak. But, uh, sure. yeah, that, that that's a tough one. Off, you're missing two starters on the offensive line and, and even a, a couple of backups. And it's – you being a quarterback, you certainly know – the effects of that as much as anybody. Absolutely. Especially you going against a defensive line. They're very athletic and they're, you know, throw records out the window when you come into a game like this against two uh, long standing rivals. Right. And, you know, and you give anyone an inch, they're going to continue to find those weak points. And we found ourselves in a game, frankly, that we had to throw it. And when you have to get away from your game plan of wanting to run the football to set up the pass, such as Virginia likes to do, that puts your quarterback in a very tough spot when you have guys playing tackle that haven't been, um, that aren't as healthy or they're younger and experienced. They haven't got a lot of playing time, and it just makes it tough when you have those edge guys being able to fly off the football at you. Absolutely, and uh, uh, like it almost made Carolina look like uh, the San Francisco 49ers front with the the pressure they put on quarterbacks. But, I was, I was looking uh, for Julius Peppers to come out and take his helmet off out there. I thought he was making a return. Yeah, it seemed that way, didn't it? Um, I, yeah, it's going to be uh, it's going to be tough. I, I guess uh, the bye week comes at a good time, Matt, because uh, this this team has some issues. It's got to overcome. One of them is is a red zone problem. They're they're ranked like 130th in the country in red zone touchdowns. Um, mm-hmm. What do you do about that? Or is there anything you can do about that? There's a lot of things you can do, and honestly, this dates back to last season when you look at the 2023 stats. I remember just doing a deep dive into that when I was getting prepared for my role this coming season on the radio team, and that was an issue when I came up for um, August camp and did a mock scrimmage or mock broadcast with John and Ahmad at the one there at Scott Stadium and just wanting to see more in the red zone and what are we going to do to improve from the year before, and I don't see the that coming to fruition like our team gets down there they can move the ball between the 20s and then it seems like they get down there to the 10 15 and things just go haywire and i don't 
I'm not exactly sure what where to put my finger on. I just think that the other day you had a drive where the first play we ran an RPO and Calandria pulled it to throw it. It looked like to Malachi Fields on a fade route, and he's blocking. So I don't know if there's a miscommunication, if there's um, lack of detail, or how we want to place things. You know, you blame can go around, right? I mean, we can blame play calls, we can blame players, but it's a collaborative effort. And you just got to get on the same page. Sometimes that means shrinking the calls you want to have in your playbook down there. Let, what do we do really good? Do we run the wide zone? Do we run downhill? Is it zone read? Is it RPO? Do we run bootlegs? Like, what do we want to be as a football team down there? Where's our strengths? And just lean on those and say, we're going to run these plays and we're going to be really good at them rather than having multiple looks and plays. Because then you, when you have that happen on first and 10 down there, then the second down play, you're stuffed. And then you're like third and goal from the nine or 10 yard line or third and 10 from the 12. And it's those are hard situations because the fields go so condensed. So it really comes down to let's find out what our bread and butter and what our identity is. And I think that's one thing that offensively through eight games, I'm not just watching it, it's hard to say what our identity is. There's some really good players and there's a lot of talent. But what is our identity? What do we hang our hat on when we're in a tough situation and we need to make plays? And I think it's it changes. And that kind of creates some uncertainty in some guys' eyes of who's going to be that guy to have the ball in his hands and be the playmaker. It, it almost seems like it's a look for Malachi Fields. <laughs> <laughs> well, and that's not a bad that's not a bad solution. I mean, he's been no, so reliable. Not, not I think at all. the one thing that and I love him as a player and two things that I, one thing about him if if we have a moment when I was at the I did the Clemson game the week before. And when our offense was struggling to move the football, find things, you know, we hit a lull in the second and third quarter in that game. We moved Malachi into the slot, got him against a nickel corner or safety. And we hit him down the seam for a 30-plus yard game, really gain, really jump-started a, a drive. What happened the other day against Carolina? We were in the same position, having trouble you know, manufacturing offense, put him in the slot, changed where he was in the formation, hit him on another 30-plus yard gain down the, down the seam, you know, where he's on guys that aren't as used to covering, and he has more space to operate because his route tree changes on the inside versus being out there at the numbers. And I think that's one thing that uh, Des Kitchings and Tony Elliott can really look at. Like, how can we get Malachi in different spots? Put him in the slot. Put him in an empty set and put him in that third man location where you normally see a tight end. Put him there where he's working on linebackers. The, the mismatches you can create are vast. And I really like to see him because of all the catches and plays that he can make. He's such a hard tackle. I mean, he's a big dude and very strong with the ball in his hand. So find a way to get him the ball wherever you can. Uh, Matt Schaub, our guest, guys. We've got viewers and listeners watching on all social media and podcasting platforms. I'm seeing eight states watching us right now on the talk shows. They listen to one of the greatest quarterbacks in ACC and UVA history on the Jerry and Jerry Show. Questions are coming in for you. Um, Mac Brown says before the game, to stop Virginia football, you got to stop number 10. Um, he said number 10 is their heart. He's the head of the snake. Um, nine sacks with Calandria, another sack with Musket. They certainly stopped um, AC. Um, fan base right now, it's the first time I've seen it all season. Some asking for Tony Musket, and if it's Musket, um, the guy that should be under center. I'm the guy at Scott Stadium that's watching uh, live action while having the earbuds in and catching you and John and Ahmad um, in my ears while I'm watching the game uh, in real time. There was an interesting uh, conversation that came up with the three of you guys when it came to Tony Musket. Um, and, and you made the comment that Tony Musket goes about his business as a professional. Even as a backup, he mm -hmm. comes in the game as a professional. He's always prepared. Ahmad made the comment uh, or responded to you by saying, you know, if Musket was the younger guy of the two, a quarterback change would have happened, but Musket is the older guy, so that's why he thinks a quarterback change would not. I'm very curious, the whole fan base is having this conversation right now. If you think a quarterback change should be made, if there's a time to do it, it would seem like the bye week is the time to do it, um, especially with the season at the crossroads right now, Matt. Yeah, um, I may differ from a lot of people's opinions on this, but I think 
you stand your ground that it's Anthony Calandria's football team and he's the starter. That's the decision you made going into the season. You say, as it stands, you're four and four. He's played well at times and has some really exciting potential. He's a second year player, so he is a far la- far less experienced playing in game like situations than Tony Musket. Um, and you made this decision as the head coach. So to stand firm in that and have him play through some trials and tribulations and some adversity, you're going to go through it. And it just so happens we're in a rough spot as a team right now. And there's a lot of injuries. There's a lot of reasons for that. Um, And there's a handful of throws I know AC would like to have back and a few plays. We all have those moments in games. It just so happens they're spotlighted when you lose the way the past two weeks have gone. And the way Tony Musket has played coming in in the fourth quarter. Unbelievable how he's played. Not surprised one bit given how much football he's played and, and watching him throw it. He's very decisive with the football. Could Tony be justified, Tony Elliott, that is, be justified in making a change? Yes, absolutely. I think you start bringing up a lot of different things and a lot of different questions. Then if Tony's musket struggles in the first quarter, do you flip? Whole can of worms can open up when you go that route. But to have uh, Anthony Calandria learn from experience and learn how to play this level of football, right, is important. And you're going to go on the road and you're going to play pit. You're going to go on the road and you're going to play Notre Dame. Let's let's go out and let's reset our jaw and let's show what, what we have on the inside. And, yeah, let's highlight what we need to do better at that position. But I, I think you stick stick with your, your ground and you stay with Anthony and, and say, let's go play. This is how it's going to be. And you talk to those guys. And you be very honest and upfront with them, um, you know, the situation. And I think that's how he should handle it. And I think that's that might be. I don't have any insider info, so Jerry, you you probably have way more information than I do. But uh, <laughs> that for, for me on the outside, just having I've been in it. Um, I've been benched. I've been come in as the backup. I've had all those scenarios play out. And uh, even even going back to my Virginia days, and Jerry, I know you remember it. You know, I was benched my first game of my junior season, uh, my my fourth year, the one in two thousand and two, and so. And I've rotated the year before with Bryson Spinner. So I've been in all scenarios. And I think just taking a breath and a step back this week will be huge for this football team and Anthony Calandria and everybody. And, hey, this is what we're going to be, and we're going to go do it. And that, that should be the focus. Well, you, you referenced that being benched for that one game in 2002. You uh, bounced back pretty strong from that. <laughs> yes, he did. <laughs> Uh, you ended up throwing for all, around uh, 3,000 yards or or maybe more than that and uh, became the ACC Player of the Year. So uh, you uh, took that to heart and, and built something positive out of it. And um, people got to remember that AC is going to be your quarterback for the next two years. Um, do you shatter his confidence by putting him on the bench? I, I I think I agree with Matt. I think you you got to go with him and hope that he can play his way through it and learn valuable lessons. Well, and let me just say this too: there's something that in in this day and age, and when you, you talk about the transfer portal, NIL, all these different things that these young kids, eighteen, nineteen, twenty years old have being thrown at them and all these options and you're not happy doing this you can go and do this or um there's something to be said about just sticking with it and developing that that grit and that mental toughness you have a lot of it innately but when you have to go through hard times and adversity that's what football is about and that's what being a football player is but giving guys outs and just you know coddling in a way or appeasing everyone's emotional desires like i there there's no place for it because you're exposed in football right and you got to learn how to deal with things and i think that young players this isn't just specifically to anthony calander this is to all young players you got to go through some hard stuff you got to deal with it and you need to learn how to stand up and and say look this isn't going to happen again enough like i'm going to handle my job totally agree um this, uh, I wanted to uh, mention that you, you were up here not only as uh, an analyst in the radio booth on the radio network this Saturday, but you were also honored, and you brought your lovely family to Scott Stadium. Uh, you were honored by the Virginia Football Alumni Club 
in their Who's Making a Difference program. Um, what was that like for you and your family? And also, uh, just speak a little bit. Uh, certainly, you were honored for your not only your, your football career, but they, this is this award is is for stuff off the field. If you could talk a little bit, I think you're involved in a children's hospital or or something mm -hmm. to, to that nature down in, I guess, in Atlanta. Right. You know, a huge honor. Um, when I was notified, you know, in early August, um, that the alumni club wanted to honor me at this game. And, you know, it happened to be one that I was calling, which was a great, um, coincidence. Um, and then I, when I told my wife and I wanted them to come up, we have five kids. Um, they've been to Charlottesville one time for an in and out for a Virginia tech game, but they're older now so they can understand and they can see and go up for a weekend and experience Charlottesville, experience the game. It was a beautiful weekend. I'll be there. My parents came, my sister and my uh, brother-in-law and niece. And so to have everyone there and be a part of it, um, they got to come in the booth for a little bit at the post game. So it was cool to see them in, in an environment that I know so well and a place that means so much to me. So to have that happen was was just awesome um and just talking about some of the stuff off the field my wife and i we had started our own foundation back in 2010 2009 2010 and um we're doing some work with a children's hospital down in texas outside houston um okay. and then we carried it with us to yeah and that's where we really did and what sparked all that was when we were having our first child and once we were really integrated in the medical system, just going through the, all the checkups and everything with her and just seeing the impact you can have on kids with medical needs, that's really where our pulse of our, our, our desire for our philanthropic goals, you know, stemmed from. And so we got involved with them. And then honestly, you know, when we came here to Atlanta, we brought it with us. Uh, but then we got tied to more of the networks here in Atlanta um, uh, Children's Healthcare of Atlanta. Um, we do a lot with them. So my wife's on the board of, of, of their hospital, and then we do stuff with Make-A-Wish. So there's different avenues that we really get involved, but most, if not all of them, all deal, deal with children and doing the most we can to help, help them um, just be able to, uh, for whatever needs it is, medically or when in case of Make-A-Wish, some of them are, are terminally ill children, giving them some hope and some positivity. That's awesome. Uh, you should be saluted, you and your wife, for that. It's, it's incredible. Um, Thank you. You're not only uh, doing some UVA games with the radio network, but you're also uh, in the TV booth for the Falcons, right? Uh, no, I wasn't for them. I did do a little bit in the preseason this year with Houston. Okay. I went over there and did a little bit. Um, but I think, I think I know where you're getting that. Um, the one title, I think, that was put in, um, was a little misleading. Uh, last season, I was on the staff, on the coaching staff for the Falcons as, as an analyst slash game right. management situational coach, helping Arthur Smith, the head coach at the time, with some of the in-game um, clock management challenges, just some of that analytical stuff that uh, coach decisions that coach have to make on the fly. That sometimes there things are going so fast and chaotically that someone just to have that. Uh, pulse is, is necessary. So that was my role last season. Okay. Matt, what goes into, uh, what goes into the bye week? What, give us the behind the scenes here. Give us a, a quarterback and, 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 you know, locker room perspective, but what goes into the bye week here with the coaching staff and the guys trying to find an identity and, and, and get, you know, the season off the skids. Yeah, it, it, it all goes to, um, you're always preparing for your opponent during game weeks, but this is an inside look. This is looking in the mirror. This is let's self scout, self evaluate as if we're preparing to play ourselves. Um, and now you have eight games. And I know they had a bye week earlier in the season, so really you can look at what, however many games it's been since then, and really do a deep dive on on what's working, what's not. Where's the glaring tendencies? Where do we? Where, what are areas of improvement? Right, X's and O's, and uh, situational football stuff. And those are the things you really got to highlight and practice and say, you just don't go through the motions like, hey, we want to be um, deliberate in our practice and what we're trying to get done and why we're trying to get done. I think it's important for players to know why. OK, listen, yeah, all these plays look good on paper, these statistics that you can throw up. But what do they really mean and how are they going to translate when we go out to practice? That's vital to me. 
And from a player standpoint, it's that just that it's taking it even one step further because the coaches look at it not only from an individual player perspective, but in totality. What are we doing scheme wise, but also health wise? I mean, so many players, I get it. No one's healthy 100 percent at this point in the season. So you got to manage some injuries. You got to manage some ankle tweaks or shoulders or whatever it is you got to you know nurse those things you got one more month and you're four and four and you got some really good football teams to play so if you want to make a bowl game you want to end your season on a super high note the opportunity is right there there's no there's no time no one's going to feel sorry for you and no one's going to just let you walk into their building in in pittsburgh or notre dame they're not going to let you walk in and just roll over and let you win because they feel sorry for you um, so you got to get yourself ready to go play some good football teams, and it's a great opportunity. Why not? Let, let, uh, why not now? But this week is is vital for these guys to just get down and watch some film and understand, okay, what am I doing, and how can I be better? What uh, just going back to your playing days at Virginia, Matt, for uh, Al Gro, What what's your fondest memory? Ooh. Fondest memory, I, there's so many. It's vast. I mean, I don't know if you want me to specifically talk my fondest memory, Al Grow, or just my favorite fondest memory of playing at Virginia my time there. I mean, if it's that, it's beating Virginia Tech at Scott Stadium in 2003 as our last <laughs> regular season game before the bowl. I mean, it had been four years of not beating them. And to finally beat mm-hmm. them in, in the manner that we did, the crowd, the way, I mean, it was just an all-around awesome way to end a career um, for us older veterans on the team and and to beat those guys. I mean, it was it was really sweet. And so, I mean, that's definitely, and I think that was, uh, Jerry, I got to say, that was probably one of the more layup-ish type of questions you've ever given me. Um, <laughs> but I'm glad I went with that and I didn't change my answer. <laughs> here's, a, here's, a, here's a tough one for you, a straightforward one for you. Best player you played with, um, and we'll wind down the interview because his man, his his time is valuable. Best player you played with in an orange and blue uniform. Oh, in the orange and blue. Oh man, if any of my teammates are listening, I don't want to have to leave anybody <laughs> out. I was fortunate, man. I was fortunate. There were so many. You good had some teammates. big time players. We had some great talent, but we had some great guys. We had some dudes that I'm still in touch with today, 20 years later. Um, just fantastic players, but people too. Um, so it's hard to really just point one out. If we're just talking on the football field, I mean, what better guy than Heath Miller? Um, when you look at what he meant as a player at Virginia, just as a, a teammate and production standpoint. And then, you know, if you look beyond what he did at Pittsburgh in his NFL career, um, just a guy that didn't say too much at all but just went out and just worked his tail off. I mean, it, I could say him. I, I mean, I, I, there's so many guys, but I, I just, he stands out. I mean, he meant a lot to me. I mean, I threw him a lot of passes, so um, <laughs> it'd be easy to go with him. Absolutely. Now the uh, head coach at St. Anne's Belfield Academy, Heath Miller, why don't you give him uh, one more here with the, uh, with the time clock on the interview with Matt Schaub? Oh, yeah. Uh, Going back to what I said before, t- tying that NFL record with uh, Warren Moon, 527 yards in one game. What what was that like for you? Were you in just an incredible zone that day, or, or were the Jaguars uh, just couldn't stop you? I guess a little combination of both, really looking back on it. Um, <laughs> You know, fo- football is one of those games where there's sometimes where you have to win 13 to 10, and sometimes you have to score 40 to win. And you just never know going into it. You have to be prepared for all scenarios, right? But um, sometimes how the game unfolds, it's different one week to the next. And this just happened. Um, Jacksonville, you know, they had a lot of talent on their team, but so did we, obviously. And um their quarterback got hurt and Chad Henney had come in and he started hitting one of their receivers who went wild, ran a hitch and broke a tackle and went 80 yards. Like, And so we just found ourselves in a shootout and, you know, we were a team that pride ourselves on running the ball, but we just found ourselves having to throw it and their secondary, they probably ran like three or four coverages. They weren't very diverse in, in their calls. And so we had a good beat on the plan and, and what they wanted to do to us. And it just so happened. Andre Johnson, of all guys, who just was inducted into the Hall of Fame this year, I mean, he yeah. found himself open often and a single coverage way too often. And we took advantage of it, and he made the plays. Um, we asked a lot of our offensive line, speaking of offensive line play, and those guys – 
um, drop back after drop back just gave me time and allowed me to to do what I had to do to get the ball to the open guys. And but when you're going through it, the game went to overtime. So let's not say it was a four quarter game when all those yards happened. So sometimes we, I mean, we played nearly till two minutes left in overtime. So we nearly played five quarters. So there, maybe there's an asterisk somewhere out there next to that number, <laughs> but you don't know you don't know what it is um, when you're playing. You're just doing whatever it takes to get the ball down the field to score. Um, and and so that was something that was brought up to me in the locker room after the game that Andre had 273 receiving, I think it was, give or take a few, and then what I had thrown for. And it was like, really? Like, I had no idea. All I knew is I had, thro- all I knew is I had thrown two interceptions and we went to overtime. Like, I was like, this – that's fine. And I, you know, Andre had a walk off 50 some yard screenplay in overtime to win it. So, um, it was pretty surreal to, to know after the fact that I tied Warren, I was like, why couldn't we find one more yard out there and just get one more yard <laughs> exactly. above him to be second alone? Cause I think it was Norm Van Brocklin. There was no way. I mean, he was 550, at, you know, uh, some yards way back in the in day. 1951. But, um, yeah. <laughs> there, there you go. There you go. So it was, it was pretty cool to see that happen, uh, especially after a win. Cause you don't want those things to happen after you lose. Like that's not, that's not a good way to go home in the car. Absolutely. Thank you, Matt. We appreciate you. Um, you're doing a hell of a job on the, uh, on the, uh, the radio broadcast. Um, I look forward to your perspective and insight. And as a, as a UVA guy myself uh, that was in school there while you were setting records, you're just a fantastic ambassador of, of the university, man. We're lucky to have you uh, tied to this, uh, tied to a school that we all love dearly. We appreciate your time today. Thank you so hey, much. Thanks Matt. a lot, guys. Uh, uh, Love you, man. Take care. Hey, appreciate you guys. See ya. Appreciate you, Matt. Matt Schaub, guys. Judah Wickhauer, if you want to go to the studio camera and Hootie, we'll switch seats over here. We got a lot of comments and questions coming in. What a fantastic um, interview um, from Matt Schaub. And J-Dubs, make sure these mics are on if you can, and then mics three and four are turned off. Um, Matt Schaub, guys, our guest, thanks to the Virginia Sports Hall of Famer, Jerry Hootie Ratcliffe. And a lot still we got to cover. Um, viewers and listeners, let us know your thoughts. We'll relay them live on air. We appreciate you guys asking questions. A number of folks, um, Hootie Ratcliffe, asking about the, the quarterback play. Um, and I understand why, they, why they're asking uh, the question. The most popular guy on a team that's struggling is the guy that's holding the clipboard on the sidelines, the backup quarterback. Um, folks are pointing to the success Tony Musket has had since he's entered the ball game. It's important to caveat that success. Musket is, is playing in a fourth quarter period that is some, some would call, um, you know, not garbage time. but mop when, up. Mop up time, yep. Yeah. When backups are in as on the opposing defenses. Yeah. Um, prevent defenses where you can accrue yardage uh, and you can move the ball around. I'll give you the open-ended one again with some time to pick it apart. What do you do with the quarterback play, Hootie? Yeah, I'm not throwing shade on uh, Tony Musket because he's a, a quality young man, but um, you, you just described the scenario very well. And he's not facing the same kind of pressure that Calandria is when he comes into the game because – at that point, essentially, the game is over. They're just playing it out. But um, I think they have to stick with Calandria and just try to work things out. Uh, um, he's had greater moments, but they've got to find s- some ways to protect him. I mean, he was sacked ten times or nine times at Musket once in that game, and even the times he wasn't sacked, he was under incredible pressure. They've got to find uh, some solutions to that because I'm sure Pitt is watching that game film and they're probably frothing at the mouth. Licking their chops. Licking their chops, waiting for their chance to do the same. Um, And you certainly know Notre Dame is is thinking that as well. And uh, Mac Brown, he's not in the Hall of Fame for nothing. I mean, I know he's having a a tough year down there and his – Mac Brown's a great coach. He is a great coach. Yeah. Um, and he he analyzed things pretty well. He said, we knew that number 10 is their spirit. And if we stop him, we stop Virginia. And he was absolutely right. 
And Virginia's got to find some ways to counter that because uh, uh, if they don't, uh, they, they're going to struggle. And they could end the season on a seven-game losing streak. I, I'll ask you. I wasn't going to ask uh, Matt Schaub this question, um, you know, with his ties to the, the athletic department and the radio broadcast. Uh, but I will ask you, the Virginia Sports Hall of Famer, if the team ends on a seven-game losing streak, and Hootie, on paper, the Vegas odds makers would suggest this season ends on a seven-game losing streak. Yes. And that seven-game losing streak would include a loss to Virginia Tech in Blacksburg, another mm-hmm. one at the hands of the Hokies. Right. If the team finishes in that kind of fashion, you know the questions are going to start coming. Mm-hmm. What does it mean for the coaching staff, the head coach, and, and his lieutenants? It's going to be a lot of heat on this coaching staff and a lot of heat on Carla Williams because the fan base, some of the fan base is going to be hot. No question about it. They're they're going to want heads to roll. Um, Personally, I don't think, and I'm not saying that I agree or disagree with this, but I, I don't think that, that they will fire Tony Elliott, even if they do end on a seven game losing streak. I think, they will give him one more year to try and straighten things out. And that if he can't after next season, that might be a different question. But I think they, they did see improvement overall in the program this year. And next year won't be easy, Jerry, because this is a, a very senior and, and graduate student laden football team they're going to lose a I lot mean, of personnel lose lose their two best players yeah i mean talking about who's your best player on offense probably fields yeah your best player on defense is sanker right you're losing your two best players yeah yeah you're going to lose a I mean, lot. the best player on the roster is probably sanker right probably so yeah yeah second best player on the roster is probably malachi fields yeah uh <laughs> There's a ton, a ton of guys that are going to be gone after this season just because their eligibility runs out. But uh, so next year will not be an easy task either. Um, maybe the schedule will, light, will lighten up a little bit. I don't know, but um, you know, there, there's going to be people calling, if not for for Elliot's head, then for him to make some staff changes and. Um, we saw what happened the last time that occurred at Virginia. It ended up with Bronco Mendenhall saying thanks but no thanks and resigning out of the blue, and they had to start from scratch all over again. So um, it's going to be a very interesting postseason to see what develops there. Again, I, I don't think that there's going to be a head coaching change but uh, there could be some changes to the staff. Um, Ace, your buddy on Twitter. Um, I mean, and this is all over, all over the show right now. Um, Ace is saying on Twitter they should definitely make a switch to Musket. What do you have to lose at this point? Not much. It seems every time he comes in, he does something good. Granted, it could be in garbage time against backups, but still, Musket deserves a shot. I'm sure AC would support him. Ace also on Twitter, I can definitely see Matt and Hootie's point of sticking with AC. He will learn and grow from these tough times and will probably be a good for UVA football in the long run. I is probably with many fans what a better chance to win today and let's worry about tomorrow. The point Matt Schaub also made that should be highlighted is this. In the transfer portal, he said, young men need to fight through adversity and not just be given an out in adverse times. Another point that needs to be made in the transfer portal era, and we're about to talk a Florida State transfer to UVA who hit the transfer portal before even playing one game. Yeah. I mean, that's bananas here. That's the world we live in. We're going to talk about that. So coaches have to think, if I pull my starting quarterback, does this give him the ammunition or cause the frustration for him to also enter the transfer portal? At the same time, my other quarterback, Musket, has exhausted his eligibility and has already told the coaching staff, I've done this for five years. I don't want to do it anymore. Yeah. And, you know, what if he, what if he comes in and plays well against Pitt 
and starts the rest of the season. And then what AC that, leaves. And AC leaves. Where, yeah. where are you then? Right. Uh, it's unfortunate that's the era we're in. It is. And I, I think AC is a kid that is not going to be tempted by NIL money because his family is it's very wealthy. Is very wealthy. Uh, so I don't think that is an issue. But the fact that you're on the bench <laughs> – yeah, that weighs heavily on on some of these kids because they want to play, and that's that's one of the main reasons people leave programs to begin with. They want more playing time. Um, but another factor is that <clears throat> when you're under duress like he was against Carolina and against most teams probably because they're going to take a blueprint of that, um, AC is, is much better on the run and, and – using his feet, he's much more mobile than than Tony Musket is. And so that's that's a factor I'm sure the coaches are weighing in on as well. Um, an interesting piece of this, this puzzle, um, North Carolina's defense had 10 sacks against Virginia. You look at the stats, this is the same North Carolina that gave up 70 points to JMU. And they only had 15 sacks the whole year. In, in eight games. Yeah. And six of those were in the opening game. Uh, the, exactly. <laughs> the point I was going to make is North Carolina's defense is not great. No. You can make an argument it's not good. And now you're traveling yes. to Pittsburgh. You're playing the fighting, you're playing Notre Dame and South Bend. You got SMU, who looks like the real deal, and a Virginia Tech football team that, by the skin of its teeth, could be atop of the Atlantic Coast Conference if the cookie crumbled a different way for the Hokies. You're looking at defenses down the stretch that are on paper significantly better than UNC's. No question about it. And uh, and that's definitely going to be a factor in the long run. And again, these coaches are really good coaches, and they're going to analyze that Carolina film to death to see what worked and, and why. And part of that, again, was because the offensive line was so banged up. But uh, they're going to still use some of those same tactics to attack Virginia and try to force AC into making mistakes and try to limit this Virginia offense. This is a straightforward question for you. This is an interesting topic for, for content creators and media creators like us. Carla Hernandez, Carla Williams, Carla Hernandez, our old human resource director at the Daily Progress, Carla Williams, the athletic director at the University of Virginia, has said she's going to do a national coaching search with Virginia men's basketball. She's going to give Ron Sanchez the year to coach as the interim but regardless, she's going to do a national search. She said that on the record. Will the commitment to a national search with the most prominent program, basketball, discourage the athletic director from doing a synonymous search with the second most prominent program in the department, the football team? It's rare you have two going on at the same time. That, that, that is an AD's nightmare. AD's sure. nightmare. Um, I don't think so. I, again, I could be wrong. Mm -hmm. It could be a factor of how many of the heavy hitters are, would want to change. But I really don't think that she's planning on getting rid of Tony Elliott after this season, even if they don't win another game. I think she'll try to give him another year to get the job done. Uh, again, I could be wrong on this, but uh, unless uh, – uh, a couple ADs have told me over the years that if a coach is struggling, a lot of times they will look. The AD will look at two things: one, how he handles himself during that stressful period, and if he loses the team or not. And right now, uh, Tony Elliott's handling himself pretty well. He he fell on the spear after the game the other day and took total responsibility and, and was embarrassed and apologized to the fan base and the administration for not having the team ready to play, and that was on him. He owned it. You buy that? Um, to some degree, but, you know, you talk to the players, and they said we had a really good week of practice. I watched an interview we, on we X. Didn't, we didn't see any of this, this coming. I watched an interview on X with you in it. 
You were in the interview next to the tight end. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. Literally yeah. standing next to yeah. him in the locker room. Tyler Neville. Tyler yeah. Neville, the Harvard transfer. Right. When he straight up said, we were prepared and ready to go, I'm shocked that this happened. Yeah. The, pre, the, the week of practice was not indicative of our performance. Yeah. I, I think this coaching staff got out coached. Uh, I think Carolina came in with a great game plan and executed it to perfection. And uh, I, again, the players said they had a good week of practice and, and were ready to play. So, uh, so there was some lack of communication in there somewhere because things just went haywire from from that snap sailing over AC's head. Nothing else really went right the rest of the day, but. Um, I, I, I really, I really don't think that he has lost the team, uh, at this point that could change. Who knows what the players believe or don't believe in. Uh, we, we did see some, some interesting, uh, I didn't actually see it. I was watching, uh, some of the action in my binoculars. I didn't, wasn't watching the sideline, but apparently, uh, Mikhail Boley, the left tackle, got into it with one of the coaches and, and maybe even with Elliot, and was essentially sent to the locker room from what I was told. That's what happened. Yep. Um, sometimes we don't see all of that in the press box. I don't know if that was brought out on the TV broadcast or not, but um, certainly a head coach can't allow that to happen and apparently got things straightened out there immediately. I don't know what kind of aftermath there may or repercussion there may be there we won't get to, there's no press conference this week so we don't get a chance to ask tony musk or tony elliott about that situation but uh there's no indication at this point that he has lost the team and and those are two things that ad's look for uh if a team is struggling and whether or not they should replace a coach so i i don't think there will be a coaching search at the end of the year i could be wrong but there may be some suggestions that uh, uh, some staff changes, and and we'll have to wait and see how that rolls out. But um, those watching on television have cut the clip of Bowley and his interaction with Tony Elliott, and the clip that's circulating on Twitter. And this is just the era we're in. Has Bowley mouthing "I quit" to Tony Elliott? I, I, I saw that, yeah, and, um, and that's a uh, clip some, that's going around the internet. Sometimes that's you know a lot of heat of the moment stuff as well. So I'm sure cooler heads will prevail once uh, once the game was over. And, and uh, Bowley's father, who I've talked to before, was an NFL player, and I'm sure. Uh, had a good conversation with his son after the game. So I, I'd be very surprised if if those words were uh, – I think it was said in the heat of the moment. And uh, I really would be surprised if he ends up quitting over um, some kind of an altercation. What do you do going into the bye, Hootie? You've been around football more than anybody. Well, I totally agree with with uh, what Matt Schaub said, and, and I've, I've said this – before the first bye week they had that you go in and you find out what you're doing well and you focus on that you eliminate the bad plays and you, you certainly they self scout and and I, I i think that's part of it they may have to go back to some of the fundamentals the, the big thing is getting those offensive linemen well uh, they lost another one for the season. Jimmy Chris broke his ankle in the game, late in the game. Uh, so that's one less body they have. Um, I, I mean, they're they're in a tough spot right now. We all knew that. We we said this before the season even started that these the last half of the schedule was nasty, and it's not going to get any easier from this point out. Um, they're going to try. They're going to have to find ways to make AC more effective. Whether that's rolling out, having ro having a rolling pocket to where he doesn't stand in there and and wait for the pocket to collapse, but to throw on the run, um, maybe use some other misdirections and stuff so the defense can't key on what he's doing. Um, 
they might have to simplify things a little bit more. You know, the old saying, KISS, K-I-S-S, keep it simple, stupid, uh, make things less complicated, and just go uh, with the only things that, that, that work well that you're doing well. Um, but they're, in, they're between a rock and a hard place right now, and I don't see any way out of this mess. I, I think it, it's going to be very surprising if they win another game, uh, against considering who they're going to be playing. I, I concur. I concur. And I'm a glasses half full kind of guy. And yeah, me too. I, I know I, you I are. I try to stay positive. You but, are positive. But uh, I'm also a realist. You're a realist. You're facing We're a realist. three ranked teams and going to Blacksburg where you haven't won since – a lot of our viewers weren't even born right. in 1998. Um, so um, Last time they won in Blacksburg, I was 17 years old. Uh, yeah, and, and I was a grandfather for the first time in 1998. Yeah. <laughs> so that shows I mean, you it's been a long time. <laughs> it's, 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 a, it's a black hole. Uh, we, we are glasses half full kind of people. We're also realists. Um, Pittsburgh, uh, Notre Dame, SMU, Virginia Tech. These are, these are the real deal, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, these are the real deal. We're talking ranked opponents. These teams are, are fighting for a chance to play in the ACC championship game and a college football playoff. Yeah. So they're not going to be taking it easy on you by we're, any we're, means. We're playing three teams that are fighting for a chance to play in the college football playoff. Yeah. And Virginia Tech, I, I need to highlight this to, as much as it pains me to say this, Virginia Tech is a damn good football team. If the ball bounces uh, a certain way in two of these games they lost, this football team is a top 20 football team. I mean, we're, we're looking at murderer's row to close the season here. And I watched the Vanderbilt game and I watched the Miami game from start to finish against Virginia Tech. They should have won those games. Uh, they had some bad luck in those contests. A lot we have to cover. The 11:15 marker, and we have significant basketball news to report. News that's going to be on JerryRackliff.com. Uh, follow Jerry Rackliff on Twitter. The man's breaking news left and right. We got a six foot seven Florida State transfer that commits to Tony Bennett and his program. That within 24 hours of the interim coach Ron Sanchez calling the point guard position, point guard by committee, with Day-Day Adams, with Day-Day Ames, with Christian Bliss, and with Jalen Worley. Jalen Worley said, peace, I'm out. I'm transferring from the program. I don't even care if I don't play. I'm going to redshirt my last year of basketball. I have not played in a, a minute of basketball, real basketball at UVA, but I don't want anything to do with this program. This is shocking news here. Yeah, it is shocking. Uh, uh, particularly with the timing of it all. Um, I, I don't know if that was the straw that broke the camel's back with what Ron said yesterday, but he was just being honest, uh, obviously, that nobody has stepped up and won the position. And if 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 uh, Worley had fallen behind the other competitors at the job, Bliss and, and Ames, then... Um, that's on him, but uh, the, to quit a team eight days before the season opener is just it just shows you what is so wrong with with college sports today. I mean, that's yeah. The head coach resigned because of the NIL and the transfer portal, and then less than a week later, was it? It's less than a week later, the prize transfer point guard quits. It's, it's, I, I don't have the words to describe how malfunctioning this whole system is. And we're going to see this all over the country. I, it's not just at Virginia, but, um, I mean, what's Ron Sanchez supposed to say? <laughs> he was Did asked, he make a mistake? Uh, you know, I, I'm sure that he's just telling us what – the players already knew. Uh, if, I can't imagine that Jalen Worley was taken by surprise that it's going to be uh, point guard by committee. I think Tony Bennett actually mentioned this in Charlotte uh, a couple of weeks ago or whenever that was at the ACC tip-off that uh, it was going to be point guard by committee. So I, I can't believe it's a shock to Jalen Worley. You don't know who's in that kid's ear. Um, yeah, 
these days, street agents uh, tampering from other programs, um, who knows what the bottom line is there, but um, I, I just can't believe that that came as a shock to him that that uh, it's going to be point guard by committee, and now the committee's a little bit less. Um, of the three, Christian Bliss, Day Day, and Worley, which three was the most important to the team? Well, I, th I think, and we haven't seen Bliss play since high school, since he was uh, redshirted last year and then had surgery. And uh, so we, we haven't seen him play. So we don't know where he stands in the in the pecking order and, and how his game is at this point. We'll see that soon. But uh, by all accounts, Day Day Ames has, has been pretty effective. And Ron Sanchez said yesterday he's got a little boogie in his in his game, uh, which I think probably separates him a little bit from the other two. I agree. Uh, he's got the most upside plus the most uh, – plus three years of eligibility. Worley's a 6'7 a, a guy, so he's got length. Uh, but he wasn't a great shooter from everything I understood. Offensively limited. Offensively limited. Um not the kind of guy that's going to create a lot of offense for the, his teammates, whereas I think Day Day probably is. So um, I, I would have, if if I were a betting man, I would have put down money that Day Day was going to get the bulk of the playing time right out of the gate. I a thousand percent agree with you. Now the curious question is, what's the starting lineup look like? Well, we <laughs> we're about to find out. We we know a little bit more now. That you're looking at probably what day day at the one. Does McNeely play the two or the three? We know you're going to see T.J. Power at the four, and from press conference yesterday, it looks like the San Diego State transfer uh, Elijah Saunders is going to see some significant minutes at the five with some small ball. If they play small ball, he'll be. He can play five. He can guard two through five. Um, Said he's a physical specimen. Blake Buchanan is uh, has a year of experience under his belt, so um, certainly he, he could play the five. Um, Tane Murray, uh, I, I was very impressed with the way he came on strong at the end of last season. So he's going to give them another weapon and experience, and then. Andrew Rohde, uh, although he had a miserable shooting year last year, he still – every other facet of his game was solid. And so uh, I, I think people seem to forget about him, but I think he's going to be a factor on this team too. I can't too. believe that he will have another poor shooting year like he had last year. Um, Virginia basketball, guys, the, all the content, all the news on jerryrackliff.com. Hootie, you are loaded with content. Well, we were happy to see uh, our good friend Jay Huff sign, oh, yeah. sign a, a contract. Four-year contract Four with year. the Grizzlies. That's I'm so happy for him. He's it's a, such a good guy. We're going to have him on the show sometime soon, and he's already agreed to come on. But um, that just shows you the persistence. I mean, he was that kind of guy at UVA. He rode the bench and rode the bench because he wasn't strong enough. He, he His defense was – footwork was – a little bit off, and he finally uh, kept working hard and, and ended up being a, a really good player for Virginia, and he's hung in there for four or five years now in the NBA, and no more two-way contract. He's, he's going to be making some big bucks and getting some real playing time with the Memphis Grizzlies. Uh, Jay Huff, congratulations. Um, I want to close with this metric for the viewers and listeners. Um, Notre Dame is seven and one overall. The Pitt Panthers are seven and zero oh overall. That's fourteen and one. SMU seven and one overall. That's twenty one and two. Virginia Tech five and three overall. That's twenty six and five. The combined records of Virginia's remaining opponents: twenty six wins and five losses. Yeah, I mean it's a. It's as close to a murderer's row as we're going to find it at this point in the season. And 
we've documented that Virginia hasn't played well at Pitt over the years. It used to be Hinesfield. I don't know what they call it now. The last one in the Al Groh era, right? Al Groh beat Dave Wanstatt. Yeah. Uh, two NFL, former NFL coaches going at it. And that's Virginia's only win there. They've had a couple of other games where they played fairly well, but generally they've been dominated at Pitt. Um, everybody, <laughs> it's, you don't have to say anything about Notre Dame. Uh, they're playing for a college football playoff spot, so they're not going to overlook Virginia, no matter what Virginia's record is. SMU is uh, in a huge game with Pitt this week. So th that's an elimination game for one of those teams. But uh, SMU is still going to come in here, win or lose against Pitt, um, looking to continue to make a splash in the ACC. And uh, you, you don't even have to say anything about Virginia Tech. We, all you got to do is look at last year's scoreboard and how embarrassing that was. Um, and for them to come back out on the field after the game and pose for pictures was the ultimate insult. And if I were a Virginia football player, I would be so pissed off I would go to Blacksburg and play with my like my hair was on fire. But for some reason, these guys don't seem to get up for Tech like Tech gets up for Virginia. And the fact that they haven't won there since 98 is uh, just complicates matters even more. Jerry Ratcliffe, the namesake of jerryratcliffe.com. He set up the interview with Matt Schaub, one of the greatest football players in Virginia history, one of the greatest quarterbacks in ACC history. A and man one of the had, great guys, too. Oh, he's fantastic. And fun, a guy, fun guy. A guy who's involved professionally into a fantastic broadcaster. Yes, absolutely. I mean, he's, he's, he's fantastic. I think he could have a future there if that's what he wants to if do. If that's what he wants to do. I mean, absolutely. Uh, check out jerryratcliffe.com for everything UVA-related. The metrics are going to be going through the roof. Um, at jerryratcliffe.com. If you're trying to reach Virginia fans, UVA fans, there's one place to do it, and that's jerryratcliffe.com. Judah Wickhauer behind camera. He got the interview set up, got the Skype working. He's a wizard. Helped us transfer seats in the middle of the show. <laughs> I, told Matt, I told Matt Chubb that you're in good hands with uh, your Skype interview because Judah is a wizard. He uh, gets it all figured out. All on the fly. All on the fly. With even temperament. Judah Wickhauer, director and producer of this talk show on our network. Mr. Cool. Um, the I Love Seville show, guys, at 12.30 p.m. Thank you kindly for joining us on the Jerry and Jerry Show, featuring the Virginia Sports Hall of Famer, Jerry, Hootie, Ratcliffe. So long, everybody. Uh, Judah, I sincerely.